All right, uh, so thanks everyone for tuning back in for, I guess, our second session. Well, we're gonna talk about uh, pulsars and solar system and the business of making the GBT. We're gonna start off with just a very brief set of comments from Jay Lockman, I think a little bit carryover from this morning. And then we will move into the first talk by uh, David Nice and then John Luke. And I know Jean Luc has a 3 p.m. Eastern time hard cutoff. So I am going to keep us uh, fairly tightly on schedule here. But uh, Jay, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, yeah, um, this evening I'm going to give a talk about what was in the GBT proposal as far as the expected science program of the GBT. But I just wanted to remind everyone that by the time it came to start scientific obser observations on the GBT, the proposed science had no force whatsoever. In fact, it was open to the community, usually in small groups of scientists, to decide what was the most important science that would be done at the GBT as it then existed. And then these scientists had to convince a uh, panel of other scientists that their projects were most worthwhile uh, to get the time on the telescope. So what we're going to be seeing this afternoon is not a hypothetical science program, but the results of the collective wisdom of the community and the use of the GBT for science discovery. So take it away. All right, thanks, Jay. And so we're gonna open up with uh, David Nice, who is a professor at Lafayette College. Also, he's a Jansky Fellow in Charlottesville. And I think I remember him telling me that his project that he was gonna work on as a Jansky Fellow was the first round of pulsar surveys with the GBT, which I think probably got delayed a little bit past what he was thinking. Um, but David, go ahead and uh, take it away. All right, thanks very much. Can you hear me, Ryan? Yep, you sound good. Okay, terrific, thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, so I applied to be a Jansky Fellow in 1992 uh, when the GBT was about two years from completion. I wrote up a very nice proposal to do some, at least I think it was nice, and I guess NRAO thought it was nice because they hired me, to do some pulsar searching and some instrumentation with the GBT. I joined uh, NRAO as a postdoc, a Jansky Fellow in 1993, when the GBT was about two years from completion. And then in 1996, my term as a Jansky Fellow was over, and the GBT was huh, about two years from completion. Um, so it's a long wait to get to, the, to uh, actually use the GBT but I think that it has been worth the wait. And I'm gonna talk a bit about um, some of the Pulsar stuff that has gone on with the GBT. Um, uh, I did in preparation for this talk, a little ADS search of all papers in the astronomy literature that mentioned the GBT and the word Pulsar. There are 1,739 of those papers uh, over 20 years. That's about one every four days or so. So there's been an incredible amount of work done. And so obviously in a 15 minute talk, I can really only give the tip of the iceberg in terms of what has been done with the GBT, just a, a few highlights. And before getting into those highlights, I thought it would be worth talking about uh, what we thought might be done, some predictions that were made uh, before the GBT came online. So, oops, well actually no, even before that, just because this is a general audience, I wanted to say a few general words about who cares about pulsars? I remember actually my first talk at NRAO, a lunch talk, uh, when I told was you know talking about my thesis work and talking about how great it was that we were finding new pulsars uh, then at Arecibo, uh, and a graduate student came up to me and said, "So what's the big deal about pulsars? Who cares about them anyhow?" And the next couple of slides are supposed to address that a little bit. So the core idea is we have a pulsar, a rotating neutron star here. Uh, its beams sweep around and they appear to us at our telescope over here, our nice little offset PowerPoint telescope, uh, as a series of pulses that have traveled through the space, through space for several thousand years, because a typical pulsar is several thousand light years away from us. And um, if there was only the pulsar and the telescope and nothing else, these pulses would just arrive very steadily at our pulsar and life wouldn't be very uh, exciting. But in fact, there are a lot of other things that go on. Uh, many of our pulsars are in binary orbit, so they get farther and closer to our telescope. Our telescope is on the Earth, which rotates and goes around the sun, so it moves closer and farther from the, uh, the pulsar. So the time it takes these pulses to travel uh, varies over the course of observations and over days and years, and we can use that information to map out things like binary orbits 
We can learn about positions and motion of the pulsars. We can learn about the interstellar medium between the pulsar and us, and many, many different things. A, a copious amount of uh, astrophysics can be done here. And then finally, if we can model all of this stuff and get back to something that looks like this, we might have one more thing. And this has been a big uh, effort over the last 15 years with the GBT, which is searching for gravitational waves. We might imagine that there's a pair of supermassive black holes uh, orbiting each other with a period of maybe a few years off in the distance somewhere. That causes gravitational waves, ripples in space time that are supposed to be indicated by these blue and green stripes. And that causes the pulsar and the telescope to wiggle back and forth relative to one another a little bit, thus affecting the time it takes the pulses to travel to the telescope and the time that it takes at which they arrive at the telescope. We hope to measure those perturbations of pulse arrival times due to gravitational waves. So predictions. So um, as I mentioned, there was, and this was talked about quite a bit this morning, there was a proposal put into the NSF in 1989 to build the Green Bank Telescope. There are several pages on pulsars in that, and I just want to highlight a few things in those pages. First off, and this is good context for a few of my upcoming slides, at that time there were eight known pulsars with millisecond periods and 11 uh, binary pulsars. And each new binary millisecond pulsar should lead to fresh insights about the evolutionary paths of massive stars. It's also pointed out that globular clusters produce low mass binary stars in copious abundance, so it could be a good place to look for pulsars. Um, there was a note that millisecond binary pulsars are the most stable clocks known. Precise measurements of their pulse arrival times have already provided data on a number of tests of general relativity and for observational limits on current theories of the early universe and particle physics. And then one more page of these things. There was mention in there of long wavelength gravitational waves. So gravitational waves, I was just mentioning on that earlier um, slide. And there's a discussion of using um, observations at the GBT to support gamma ray observ observatories. In particular, it was mentioned the gamma ray observatory planned for launch in the following year in 1990. Okay. Right. So I, I mentioned that I was a, a postdoc in Charlottesville in the 1990s. In 1995, there was a meeting at uh, Green Bank. I think it was in the old visitor center actually to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the 140 foot telescope. And I was asked to give a talk on pulsars there. I, I think I actually happened to be observing at the 140 foot at that time uh, as well. And this is a slide from the talk I gave uh, at that time. And what I did was I wanted to make some predictions, have some idea of what the GBT might, might do. So what I did was I looked at the past history of pulsar discovery, and I wrote down a bunch of them. Most of them are unreadable on the slide. And four of them really stood out. The pulsar, the discovery of pulsars in the first place, in the late 1960s, the discovery of the first binary pulsar, the Hulse-Taylor uh, pulsar, which got them the Nobel Prize in the mid 1970s, the first millisecond pulsar in the early 1980s, and the first exoplanets, which were actually discovered around a pulsar by Alex Wilson around 1990 or so. And I noted that there seemed to be one major discovery roughly every seven years. So I made the prediction uh, at that time that there should be continue to be pretty major discoveries in the pulsar field every seven years in the, the GBT era. era. Uh, interestingly, and perhaps perceptively, I ended that timeline in 2020, not really imagining that I would be giving a talk on GBT uh, pulsar science in 2021, but uh, that's, that's how uh, fate has worked out. Okay, so we'll come back to this chart uh, at the end of my talk. All right. So to do any of this sort of stuff, to discover these things, you have to go out and search for new pulsars. And there's been a ton of uh, searching of many different types done at the GBT over the past 20 years. I'm just going to highlight three types of them. Just again, a little tip of the iceberg. The first, as mentioned in the GBT proposal, was searching for pulsars in globular clusters. And this is a very nice figure that Scott Ransom sent me uh, yesterday when I asked him for it at the last minute. So thank you, Scott. Uh, and if you focus on the inner plot here, what this is showing is the discovery of millisecond pulsars as, I'm sorry, not millisecond pulsars, globular cluster pulsars as a function of time. And there was a little burst of discoveries in the 1990s and then nothing. And then you can see the GBT comes along around 2000, a little bit later, and all of these green things, you know, almost 30 pulsars in one year are discoveries that were made with the GBT. So this was key early science and Scott is responsible for a lot of it. 
and really brought the GBT to the forefront as a uh, millisecond pulsar discovery machine. Uh, interest kind of faded with that. Um, the good stuff was picked. And you can see that there's now a burst here, which is due basically to new instruments, Meerkat and FAT. So a new telescope comes along, and this is one of the first things it gets used for. It's really productive. A second plot here uh, harkens back actually to the GBT proposal, which talked about using the GBT to support gamma ray observations. This gray thing is a map of the gamma ray sky, not from the gamma ray observatory, which was actually deorbited a couple of months before the GBT commissioning, but from its follow-up um, observatory, the Fermi satellite. Um, many of these dots are just gamma ray sources of uh, unknown characteristic, uh, and a lot of good use has been uh, put to taking the GBT and other uh, radio telescopes to search for pulsars at the locations of these otherwise uncharacterized gamma ray sources. And this has been an incredibly effective way of um, discovering millisecond pulsars. This particular paper, which is from way back in 2012, is showing 43 newly discovered pulsars, of which 24 were discovered at the GBT, so very, very productive. But sometimes you don't go to a known source, a gamma ray source, or a um, globular cluster. You just go and look at the sky and see, look for pulsars everywhere. And that's also been very productive. This is a map of the GBNCC, the Green Bank Northern Celestial Cap Survey. It's basically covering all of the sky visible to, um, to the Green Bank Telescope, so a very broad interpretation of the phrase uh, Northern Celestial Cap, spending two minutes looking at each point in the sky searching for pulsars. And it's discovered 193 pulsars so far, uh, including 33 millisecond pulsars. So that's ongoing, although I guess it is close to completion uh, at this point. Okay, so you go out and you make these searches. I want to next discuss some of the more interesting discoveries. I'm kind of biased towards binary pulsars myself, so that's that's what you're going to hear. Hopefully, other people can chime in on things that they think are interesting uh, after my talk. Okay, so one of the huge discoveries uh, in the GBT era is the double pulsar, two pulsars orbiting each other. This was actually discovered at Parks, but a lot of the uh, really important follow-up work has been done with the Green Bank Telescope simply because of Green Bank Telescope's superior gain. Uh, there's an annual review article by uh, Ingrid Stairs, who was a postdoc at Green Bank at one point, uh, and Michael Kramer some years ago. And Ingrid tells me they have a 50-page paper on all the cool relativistic things you can do with this system uh, that will be uh, submitted to. So there are two pulsars orbiting each other. At least sometimes you can see both of them, although one of them has been hiding for quite a while. And an even cooler thing is that uh, we're seeing this binary system almost edge on. So the pulsars actually can eclipse. This is pulsar B in the foreground here, and it can actually eclipse pulsar A. And this upper graph is showing the strength of pulsar A, and then suddenly it dips down during the eclipse uh, and then comes back up. And something that was discovered at the GBT by making very high resolution art, uh, observations of this eclipse is that it, the eclipse is actually not steady. This is a plot from uh, Moore McLaughlin, and you can see the eclipse going on and off and on and off. And that's actually the magnetosphere of this pulsar rotating around, sometimes blocking the signal from the more distant second pulsar and sometimes not, which is just an incredible thing. And it's taught us quite a lot about the structure of um, the magnetic fields around pulsars. Okay. Another, th another uh, really cool discovery, this one made at the GBT with follow-up work at the GBT and elsewhere is a um, system that trans um, that switches or transitions between um, a normal millisecond pulsar binary system, just a pulsar here, and a larger star over here, and one where this larger star loses mass and accretes onto the pulsar. So sometimes it's in the accreting phase, uh, sometimes it's not in the accreting phase, and though it's not in the accreting phase, it's actually visible as a millisecond pulsar. And you can actually see that the accretion changes the spin rate of this pulsar. It actually causes it to spin down uh, more rapidly than normal, which is sort of the opposite of what you'd expect, which is an interesting thing. And again, a, a very unique and new, new thing that was discovered with the GBT. Another really important contribution of the GBT is uh, measuring pulsar masses. This is a pulsar 1640 minus 2230. Again, one that was initially discovered at Parks, but had a lot of follow-up work done at the GBT because of its superior gain. Um, timing of this pulsar showed that pulses were delayed by what's called the Shapiro effect. And the idea is the pulses 
travel in and out of the companion well of the um, companion star, they get delayed by up to about 40 microseconds or something like, I know if I, rather, um, no, microseconds, what am I saying? Uh, so just a tiny amount, but the amount of that delay tells you how much space has been stretched around that star, allows you to infer its mass, and that in turn allows you to infer the neutron star mass. In this case, that is a particularly exciting result. The mass of this neutron star is almost two solar masses. And that's really significant because a sort of garden variety neutron star is 1.4 solar masses. These heavier ones really constrain what could be in the center of the neutron star. It must be something akin to ordinary neutrons and nothing, something, not something more exotic like a quark soup or something like that. Work along these lines has continued. Um, this is showing a couple of results from work by Thankful Cromerty that was just published last week, last week, geez, last year and follow up that uh, is actually sitting on a referee's desk um, right now at AppJ on another such massive uh, pulsar. This is one that was discovered at the GBT and was timed at the GBT uh, and more recently timed. And this is likely, although not completely certain, to be more than two solar masses. So might well be the most massive neutron star uh, ever discovered. Finally, I think the last system I will mention specifically is a millisecond pulsar in a triple system. So this is a neutron star orbited by a white dwarf in a small orbit and orbited by another white dwarf in a more distant orbit. And this is really exciting uh, because, well, first off, I mean, it's cool, a triple system, right? But beyond that, um, you can do very interesting and important relativistic tests. Basically in this diagram, this white thing, I guess is one of the white dwarfs and this is our pulsar. And these are both attracted to the more distant um, white dwarf by gravity, and they're attracted with the same acceleration. And that's a prediction of relativity, but it's something we can very, very carefully test with this system. And it's particularly important because it's this combination of a very dense material that actually has a bunch of uh, gravitational binding energy, this neutron star, and this somewhat ordinary material of the white dwarf. Um, so that's been a really important uh, thing for relativity tests. And you can see a couple of papers uh, in nature on that. Okay. Um, so those are a few individual binary systems. I mentioned the search for gravitational waves uh, earlier. So I'm gonna have a few slides on that. Um, just to give you guys some context for people who are not pulsar people, we're searching for gravitational waves. LIGO has discovered gravitational waves. Why do we still care to do this, uh, you ask? And the reason is that just like radio waves and optical waves and gamma rays and X-rays form the electromagnetic spectrum, there's a wide spectrum of gravitational waves. And LIGO is sensitive to gravitational waves of um, order 100 hertz or so. So LIGO is very good at discovering, say, in-spiraling neutron stars right at the moment that they spiral into uh, one another. Future space-based uh, instruments will be sensitive to things at, say, a millihertz or something like that. So they'll be able to see um, ordinary stars or really white dwarfs orbiting with each other with periods of minutes. We, on the other hand, are sensitive to gravitational waves with periods of many years. So actually 10 orders of magnitude away from LIGO's results um, in the gravitational wave spectrum. So a completely different type of astrophysics, which is why we keep pushing on this project. So we're searching for perturbations in arrival times of pulses due to telescope or pulsar being wiggled around uh, by gravitational waves. Here are a couple of data sets um, that basically do not allow you to see that happening because we haven't, haven't seen that as an in-your-face um, signal yet. We do think we see a level of noise in the pulsar signals as a whole that is what we would expect as a kind of first signal for, of gravitational waves. So we think we're seeing pretty strong hints of gravitational waves, but we can't say so definitively yet. And to say so definitively, we need to see a correlated signal across many different um, pulsars. So let me talk a little bit about that. So this map shows, as of a few months ago, the array of then 77 pulsars that we observed, about half of them with the GBT and half of them with Arecibo. And Arecibo's uh, viewing range was these, indicated by these gray lines in this map here. As you all know, Arecibo collapsed uh, a few months ago, and uh, we had to obviously end our program there without a telescope. 
what we've done is transited, transitioned most of those pulsars to the GB key. We've dropped a few of the weakest ones. We've also brought uh, in CHIME, the Canadian telescope, to do observations of, of many of these pulsars. So the program is going on and making better use of the GBQ and more use. And I should also add that we've recently gotten uh, significant funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Fund to help pay for the GBT time for a few years. So that's something that's really, really, really exciting about this program. And the reason we want to look at lots of uh, pulsars is that if we have a gravitational wave and it comes along and moves the Earth around, that means we're going to see correlated signals across different pulsars. Pulsars that are in a similar sort of place on the sky, so not very separated, are, their signals are going to be affected in the same way if the Earth moves in a certain direction due to gravitational wave. Whereas pulsars in different parts of the sky will see different correlations. So we're searching for those correlations. This is a diagram from a paper that came out last December showing our attempts to find this. We have not yet detected these correlations. And what we should see, what this is showing is how correlated signals are. It's a function from the separation distance between pairs of pulsars on the sky. So nearby pulsars over here should be correlated. Pulsars that are not close to each other in the sky should not be correlated or even be anti-correlated. And you can see that our data there don't yet really match up with a blue line like that. But you can also, if you squint and use your imagination, say, hey, it seems plausible that within a few years we're going to see that. Uh, and I'm really optimistic that within uh, with two or three more years of data added into this, that we will start seeing uh, significant uh, detection and definitive detection of gravitational waves uh, using uh, pulsars. OK. So, one of the ways we need to do that is to just, um, you know, keep adding uh, more pulsars and more more observing time. But it's also good to have improvements in instrumentation. I've just got a couple more slides here. Uh, this one shows uh, how instrumentation has evolved over the history of the GBT. The GBT has always had a really terrific set of receivers, but the digital backends that we need for pulsar observing uh, have not always been able to handle the full bandwidth that was available. So for many years, this is what this is showing is the frequency we used versus time here. For many years, we had relatively narrow instruments. We were definitely back-end limited, maybe 64 megahertz. Then with the arrival of Guppy uh, developed by NRAO, we could suddenly take full advantage of the uh, L-band and 800 megahertz receivers. So we're collecting a lot more data simultaneously, really the order of magnitude more. And we will soon be moving to the wideband receiver under development which will allow us to observe this entire range of frequencies and much, much higher all simultaneously. And I am so looking forward to that, the improvements in the data and in telescope uh, efficiency uh, as well. I also wanted to mention people. Um, this, I hope I, I, I'm going by memory here, so I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. This box on the left shows everybody who was working at NRAO in 1989 who is trained in pulsar astronomy or considered themselves a pulsar person. You can see that it is an empty box. I think other than the occasional Jansky fellow who wandered through like myself, there really was not much in the way of personnel at NRAO or what's now GBO that were working on pulsar. And that has changed uh, entirely. You can see over on the right this year, uh, you know, Walter Briskin, Paul Demers, Dale Frail, Ryan Lynch, Mark McKinnon, Tony Mitchell, Scott Rankin, all pulsar people. I apologize, I'm probably missing a person or two, but it's really uh, been tremendously good to see that as a focal area for NRAO. I also uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, WVU, and I think one of Fred Lowe's great insights was it would be very healthy for uh, Green Bank if WVU started an astronomy program and got some really good uh, radio astronomers. And they, they sure uh, hit a home run with on that one from a Paul Portsar perspective hiring Mora and Dunk up there. It's been tremendously helpful for WVU and for the GBT uh, as well. So a shout out uh, to them. Anyhow, I should get back to my prediction slide as, as I wrap up here. So I had predicted um, something every few years. If you look at just the systems I've talked about, uh, four different types of pulsars, that's about the number of exciting new things we were expecting in the GBT era. Uh, so I think we nailed that. Uh, I also should mention fast radio bursts. I guess they're not a pulsar. I don't quite know what a fast radio burst is, but they were certainly discovered by pulsar people and, and they're pulsar-like things. So I think we should count them as a pulsar discovery too. And one of those things that's really 
was properly listed mark as a question mark early on because nobody was expecting them uh, and they're really super excited. So I think the GBT has really matched and even exceeded its expectations for the last 20 years. So what I'm gonna do for my last slide is just boldly extrapolate to the next 20 years. I think we should expect at least one new and exciting uh, discovery uh, in the Pulsar field with the GBT every five years or so. So uh, that's, that's my prediction for the next 20 years. The um, proceedings for the 140 foot telescope uh, meeting 25 years ago, they mentioned were, were called, but it was fun. And what I predict for the next 20 years on the GBT is just a lot more fun. All right, so I'll end there. Thank you very much uh, for listening. I appreciate your attention. David, I think you've given us the name for our next volume. <laughs> a lot more fun. I like it. A lot more fun. All right. Um, so thank you very much for that, David. I know that we had a few uh, comments going on in the chat. Um, I just want to see if there are any questions for David or anyone else who's on the call that would like to chime in with any memories in the next five minutes before we move on to John Luke. I know Scott and Ingrid have been busy in the chat. Do they mm -hmm. have anything they want to say? Well, I'll make a comment, if I may. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's, it's good to see David again. It's great talk, David, I enjoyed it. Uh, my, my memory of him is that uh, when we were thinking of building the GBT and promoting it, I made a, a, a sketch that, that showed it was a little bit bigger than the Statue of Liberty and was showing this around the committees when David sent me his own sketch and it showed that both the Statue of Liberty and the GBT fit very nicely into the Arecibo Bowl. Yeah, I remember that. I was I did my thesis actually at Arecibo. I spent a lot of time uh, at Green Bank as well. Much of it, you know, in the concrete walls of the 140 foot telescope. But I first saw, for some reason, I first saw that uh, diagram of yours when I was at Arecibo. I think it was even my first trip there, uh, and I just couldn't resist. <laughs> well, it was good fun. It was. Anybody else want to chime in? Is, is Dan with us still? Steinbring? I know he was on earlier. Well, I just, I put it in the chat, but I, I remember distinctly, David, you, you and Dan Steinberg, both being people that talked about detecting gravitational waves with pulsars in my presence really early on. I think mm. I heard about it um, before I really recognized what LIGO was. And I was, just, that was really a thrilling yeah. prediction. I should, I should credit Don Backer uh, for, for a lot of that too. He really pushed on that. And I will say, when I was a, a graduate student in my early days, I always thought this was, oh, that you put a couple of sentences about this in your proposal and it makes some people happy or whatever, but it seemed very unrealistic. Just as people were, I think George Salstad was talking about, you know, LIGO uh, in the early days. And that's, that doesn't seem like it could possibly work. And I kind of felt the same way about gravitational waves uh, and pulsars. I mean, the, the long wavelength stuff, not the whole Taylor stuff. Um, but Don put out a paper, I think it was sometime in the early to mid 90s, uh, where he did a pretty careful analysis, of, not of phase transitions or in the early universe or cosmic strings or anything like that, but uh, of uh, supermassive black hole binary systems. And we know supermassive black holes exist in galaxies because we see all these AGNs with the VLA and the VLBA and all that. We see these things, we know they exist, we know galaxies merge, so we know these things have to come together. We know these binaries have to exist. And you can make an estimate of how many there should be. You can make an estimate of what gravitational waves they put out. And by God, you ought to actually be able to detect these things with approximately the uh, observing program that Nanograv has. So like I said, this is actually a, a realistic thing. And uh, you all should keep an eye out for this and then over the next year or two, I think, because uh, I think we're going to have some good results. Yeah, it occurs to me that it would have been amazing if there was actually a LIGO station in Green Bank along with the GBT, because we would have, um, you know, we'd be the capital of gravitational wave astronomy mm -hmm. across multiple 
transporter is magnitude mm -hmm. and the frequency. But I, I, we I'm having a hard time imagining four anything. kilometers by four kilometers L straight straight L shaped oh, straight yeah. tubes in West Virginia. But. I don't know if Jay can get it for tonight during the uh, the happy hour, but I know he has in his office um, a map of the area with one of the proposed layouts, I guess, for the mm -hmm. uh, the neutron dots. We'll publish that. I did. I did allow people to speak. I'm sorry, I had forgotten that. Said, did you want to say anything? And they didn't allow you to speak. So if you've got 30 seconds, Ingrid or Scott, I think you're able to speak now. Real quick, if uh, never needs to move on, John. No, just I guess uh, reminisce back to the the some of the very very first observations of the GBT. So obviously, I had to uh, write proposals like everybody else, but I was the Pulsar postdoc on site. And so whenever things were going all wrong with the surface or whatever, I could still get in there and observe with whatever projects were approved. So sort of remember being called to run down and sit in the server room at odd hours and try to get the spectral processor going or other things. Um, I think we've come a long way since then. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Dan, how about you? Do you want to say something? I've got you your well, I was just going to add that uh, through the years, we got enormous support uh, from um, uh, NRAO management and, uh, you know, all of the all of the directors, the site directors were very excited about Pulsar work. And, uh, you know, they they hired some terrific people when they brought in Scott Ransom and he really um, uh, got a whole bunch of exciting, uh, exciting discoveries uh, in a hurry. You know, it was. Uh, it's just been very exciting to do pulsar astronomy uh, uh, with Green Bank Instrument. And, um, you know, I think now, as David said, um, I mean, you know, unfortunately, of course, because of the demise of Arecibo, you know, uh, the GBT is going to be front and center for a, a lot of the work that a lot of people are doing. Even more so than it would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. Ingrid's mentioning of the spectral processor reminds me, that was a really good and cutting edge instrument too. Uh, I think it was the first time NRAO, at least as far as I know, had developed something that was kind of Pulsar specific, but it was terrific digital technology uh, and really quite effective for, for many, many years. It was also interesting to hear her and I think it was Ron Madalena uh, this morning reminiscing about the old like interim control room at the base of the GBT. And my memory of that is going there at night and it was probably the brightest place in Pocahontas County. And I think all the moths in Pocahontas County were attracted to that one location because my memory is just hundreds or probably thousands of moths around and inside the uh, control room, as well as just all the noise from the fans and the transformers. All right. Well, I think we can return to some more pulsar reminiscing um, maybe a little bit later on in the session. But I know that, like I said, John Luke has to go teach class uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. So we're going to move on to his talk. Um, so Jean-Luc, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Perfect. So Jean-Luc is a professor at UCLA. who's done a lot of work using the GBT as a receiver for planetary uh, radar studies, and that is what he is going to tell us about. So go ahead and take it away, Jean-Luc. Thank you, Ryan. Can you hear me? Yes. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you to celebrate uh, this anniversary and tell you a little bit about the radar observations that were enabled by the GBT over the past uh, 20 years. The radar image that you're looking at was not actually obtained at the GBT, but it may explain why the first scientific observations um, at the GBT were radar observations. Uh, what you can see on this image is the first null of the primary beam of the Arecibo telescope about two arc minutes, uh, painted on the surface of the moon. And you can see other uh, aspects of the beam pattern as well. The recording of this image was done at the VLBA antenna in Syncroy. And in order to get this image, uh, we needed a data taking system. We have 30 meter resolution here in range, which required recording at five megahertz rate, which the VLBA antenna was not equipped to do. So as a young postdoc, my first order of business was to design and build a data taking system, a backend that we could take uh, to other antennas. And eventually this backend uh, enabled the first observations, uh, scientific observations at the GPT. 
Now, it was built in a hurry, and it looks like it, right? This back end is shown here in the rack in the GBT control room. Uh, it has been an eyesore compared to the very neatly designed uh, uh, panels that the NRAO staff has built. Uh, you can see the main data taking unit here. We borrowed one of the Arecibo uh, baseband mixers, um, built a, a down converter and uh, a clock distribution system. You can also see at the bottom a clone uh, made by JPL. We sent all the schematics and the uh, software to JPL and they, they made several clones of these and, and used them at Goldstone as well. So before I go on to talk about the scientific observations, I want to remind you how powerful radar observations are. This is really a scientific experiment in which you control the frequency, the bandwidth, the, um, and several aspects of the observations. The observables are the time delay or range to the target, the Doppler shift or velocity along the line of sight, uh, the received power. Uh, we often receive in two polarizations and can form the Stokes matrix. If we have two antennas, we can measure the interferometric phase and the space-time uh, correlation function. And as a result of this, we can measure a truly astounding array of physical and dynamical quantities related to planetary bodies. And it's been a really powerful tool to characterize the solar system. So just very briefly, the, the primary technique for uh, range uh, radar observations is this range Doppler technique. So if you think about uh, receiving the echo and slicing it in the time domain, each slice, each time slice represents an annulus on the planetary body over here. And you can also slice the echo in the frequency domain, and each slice in the frequency domain represents an annulus at a constant Doppler frequency here. And therefore, the power measured at the intersection of a range and frequency slice can be localized to uh, position on the planetary body. In addition, if you have an interferometer as shown on the right, you can also measure the interferometric phase and that gives you the third dimension, the height above the surface. So both of these techniques have been used very successfully with radar observations. So now the first science observations at the GBT uh, were proposed by uh, my thesis advisor, Don Campbell. And Don wanted to address this question, uh, which remains a, an important puzzle today about the emissivity of some of the high uh, topographic regions on Venus. Here's a map from Magellan showing the emissivity of the planet. And there are some regions at high elevations that have these exceeding low emissivities, uh, something like 0.3 or 0.4. Big puzzle, not understood, still not fully understood. And we had demonstrated as part of my thesis work, Don and I, that we could measure the topography uh, of planetary bodies with high precision. And so Don's idea was to measure the topography of places like Maxwell Montes um, and try to unravel this relationship between low emissivity and altitude. So we brought in the back end uh, to the GBT. I believe Don was at Arecibo. I was at the GBT. And we had an auspicious start. Here's the logbook from Arecibo about the 24 March observations in 2001. It was windy at the GBT and there was no internet. Now, the importance of the internet was that I was supposed to log in to the Arecibo computers and look at the logs to figure out when to start the data taking system. And instead we had to do this over the phone, you know, start at 12.03.05 and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, we were successful in obtaining uh, images of Venus. Uh, here's the first day's observations, an image of Maxwell. Uh, and this image uh, has uh, important pedagogical uh, traits to it. So this is a range Doppler image as I described earlier. Uh, so we're slicing the echo in the time dimension here. And in order to slice the echo in that dimension, we transmit a repeating pseudo binary binary phase code. In this case, we used a 16,000 code, 16,000 length code, and each code element was two microseconds. And that gave us a 300 meter resolution on the surface of Venus. 
Now, 16,000 times two microseconds is 32 milliseconds. And so every 32 milliseconds, this code repeats. Now, the problem is Venus is 40 milliseconds long in terms of uh, delay depth. And so what you're seeing here is the back of the planet um, that is wrapping around and overlapping uh, over the limb of uh, the front cap of the planet. Now, you might ask, well, why did you do that? That seems uh, silly. Well, you have to remember that the code length also dictates the bandwidth uh, that you're um, measuring. So uh, 32 milliseconds gives you a bandwidth of about 30 hertz. And it turns out that Venus at inferior conjunction is 33 hertz wide. So at inferior conjunction, Venus is uh, called an overspread target, which means that no matter what parameters you're using, there's going to be aliasing in either range or frequency. And you can see some of that aliasing up here. You can see the limb uh, of the, at the back of the planet and the aliasing in frequency over here. Nevertheless, uh, observations were successful. We, we provided an image to the PR folks and they cropped it and put it in a press release. Uh, and everybody was very excited about uh, announcing that the GBT was a productive scientific instrument. In terms of the fringes, uh, we did get some fringes. And unfortunately, we were just shy in terms of signal to noise of reaching our goal of making a high precision topographic map of, of Maxwell. You can see the fringes clearly, but unfortunately they're too noisy and it, it's not possible to unwrap them to get the topographic map that we were hoping to get. The, day following the Venus observations, we observed a small near-Earth asteroid about which almost nothing was known. This was 2001 EC16. And there had been monostatic observations of 2001 EC16, but they were unable to resolve this object in frequency. And the reason for that is that a radar instrument cannot transmit and receive at the same time. So, at a round trip light time of 15 seconds, you spend about five seconds switching between the transmitter and the receiver with you know, large microwave switches and so on and so forth. And that leaves you about 10 seconds of recording time, which gives you a frequency resolution of 0.1 Hertz. Well, it turns out this object is so small and it rotates so slowly that at 0.1 Hertz, you can't resolve it. And this is one of the real strengths of the GBT is that we were able to transmit continuously from Arecibo for several minutes and increase the frequency resolution by two orders of magnitude and finally resolve this object in the frequency dimension. And by combining the size of the object that we got from the radar image and the Doppler bandwidth of this object, we were able to uh, estimate its rotation period. Turns out it's an exceedingly slow rotator. It's shown here. It uh, spins at about six days and it's about, uh, about 150 meter diameter. So it's sort of an end member object in this, in this uh, diagram of the spin distribution of asteroids. Very slowly rotator and almost certainly a tumbler as well, meaning it doesn't have a principal axis rotation, but it chaotically tumbles continuously. There have been many other observations of asteroids um, at GBT. And to prepare for this talk, I, I sent a wide uh, email to the community of radar astronomers, inviting them to submit uh, slides for this talk. And this is a contribution from Patrick Taylor with a truly astounding image of an equal mass binary near-Earth asteroid. Um, and I can't emphasize how exciting this is. We know that there are binary near-Earth asteroids out there. About one in six is a binary system, but only a very small fraction of them ha have roughly equal masses. Uh, in fact, we know of only a handful among the more than 500 asteroids that we've observed. So this is a really rare uh, object and its true nature, uh, Patrick tells me, was only really uh, established with the Green Bank observations, showing that it is truly an equal mass, truly separated binary. Uh, these images are seven and a half meters in, in range resolution. Uh, each uh, member of the binary here is about 900 meters in diameter, and they're separated by about 1.8 kilometers uh, with an orbital period of about 24 hours. So you get orbital period, you get masses, you get densities, uh, very uh, useful scientific data. Uh, this system is also fully 
synchronously locked. In other words, each component is synchronized to it or to the orbital period, and they present the same face to one another at all times. So I would love to be on the surface of this object and uh, look at the sky from that vantage point. It would be uh, phenomenal. Uh, as I mentioned, many other uh, asteroid observations at the GBT. Here's a, a slide courtesy of Lance Benner uh, indicating some of the other results that you can uh, uh, look up. I suspect near-Earth asteroid observations are going to remain very important for the GBT, uh, and that's in part because near-Earth asteroids are important in a variety of contexts. Uh, the scientific context where radar observations can characterize the spin state, the shape, the size uh, with excruciating precision. In the context of the impact hazard, radar observations typically reduce the orbital uncertainties by orders of magnitude and increase the interval of reliable trajectory predictions by a factor of four or five. If there is to be a manned mission to an asteroid, you can bet that there will be radar observations to characterize it. Uh, and likewise, any commercial interest will probably want to make a radar survey of the uh, potential targets. All right, let me move on to uh, the moon. There have been lots of observations of the moon at the GBT, and I'm going to focus on one result here by Don Campbell uh, and collaborators about the uh, lack of evidence for thick, clean ice deposits at the lunar south poles. There had been a controversial, highly controversial paper claiming the detection of ice in radar echoes in the uh, permanently shadowed craters at the poles of the moon. And uh, we, we wanted to test that, uh, that claim with additional observations. And these were enabled at the GBT. Uh, this is a South Pole crater, 20 kilometer in diameter, called Shackleton, uh, with a resolution of uh, 20 meters, I believe. And uh, the idea here was to compare uh, the polarization properties of this crater which may indicate uh, coherent backscatter return and may indicate the presence of a volume scattering in such as you might expect in ice, uh, and compare these scattering properties with other craters at lower latitudes that are fully illuminated by the sun. And what the paper showed is that there are indeed craters of similar morphology and age at low latitudes that uh, exhibit the same uh, polarization properties. And so the conclusion from the paper is that there's no evidence for these thick uh, ice deposits at the lunar south pole. I should point out that there are probably thick ice deposits at the lunar south pole in the permanently shadowed regions. Uh, it's just that they're probably mixed in with impurities such that you don't get this coherent backscatter effect in the radar return uh, that had been uh, claimed previously. Another technique that I'd like to describe is called radar speckle tracking. And in this mode of observations, we transmit a monochromatic wave, a three and a half centimeter wavelength from the Goldstone 70 meter antenna. And we record the echoes at both Goldstone and the Green Bank Telescope. Now, the nature of the radar echo from a planetary body is speckled. Its echo power varies as a function of time. And the reason for that is that there's constructive and destructive interference for, from thousands of individual scatterers on the planetary body that yield this uh, pattern. It looks like a random pattern, but it's not random. It's determined by the positions of the scatterers on the surface of the planetary body. And because they're fixed to the surface of the body, they rotate with it, and therefore the speckle pattern rotates with it. And what is shown on the top center plot here is the trajectory of these speckles as they sweep over the surface of the Earth, uh, shown with one second uh, increments here by these green dots. Now, with this technique, we have two observables. First, there's the time of day at which the speckle trajectory is aligned with the telescope baseline. And that doesn't last very long. It lasts only about 30 seconds. And that's a direct constraint on the spin axis orientation of the planetary body you're looking at. During those 30 seconds, you can also measure the time lag, how long it takes for the speckled pattern to travel from one telescope to another. And that's a direct estimate of the spin period of the body you're observing. 
So uh, during those 30 seconds window, you, you can see that the uh, echoes correlate fairly nicely. What I've done here is I've sh shifted the, uh, one of the time series by about 20 seconds to show you that apart from receiver noise, there's a large amount of correlation between these two time series. So here are examples of these uh, correlations. These are real data from Venus showing the correlation as a function of time from data taking start. And it remains very low until the speckle trajectory becomes aligned with the baseline. A very clear, very dramatic correlation and then goes back to zero. And we can time this epoch to very high precision, a fraction of a second to tell us about the spin axis orientation. And then likewise, we can measure the time lag uh, during this high correlation epoch and measure this to a fraction of a millisecond and get a very high uh, 10 parts per million or five, five parts per million uh, measurement of the spin period. So with this technique, we were able to show that Mercury is in a Cassini state. Uh, this had been proposed by Stan Peel in 1969, and it took almost 40 years and the GBT to demonstrate, to show that indeed uh, Mercury was in uh, a Cassini state. Now, the importance of Mercury being in a Cassini state is that in that rotational state, you can use the obliquity uh, of the spin axis and the amplitude of librations of the planet, small oscillations in the planet, to infer the moment of inertia of the planet and the moment of inertia of its core. So we measured the libration amplitude with Goldstone and GBT, and they're shown here. Uh, these are our data up to 2007. And on the right, we have data up to 2012. And we have very clearly detected the libration amplitude of Mercury. It turns out the amplitude of that libration indicates whether the core is solid or liquid. And it would be a factor of two smaller if the core of Mercury uh, were solid. Very clearly, uh, the core of Mercury is molten. So we've established that with very high confidence. In addition to that, we can also measure the core size. So for the first time, we've had a detailed model of the interior structure of Mercury. And again, from a planetary perspective, this is an exceedingly important measurement because the interior structure of a planet determines pretty much everything about its evolution, its thermal evolution, its geologic evolution, its spin evolution, its magnetic field evolution. So this is a really important measurement that uh, we've been able to do with the GBT. Uh, we're trying to do the same thing at Venus, and here are our measurements uh, of the Venus spin axis orientation shown in black. Uh, and you can see that we are improving the best spacecraft measurements by a factor of 5 to 15 in each dimension. So this is a highly uh, high precision measurement of the spin axis of Venus. And for the first time, we're actually able to measure the precession of the spin axis. And Venus precesses due to solar torques. Uh, and the it depends on the moment of inertia. There's a direct proportionality between the moment of inertia and the precession rate. So we've been able to measure that precession rate and infer the moment of inertia of Venus and therefore estimate the size of its core. Uh, and this ends a somewhat embarrassing episode where we didn't know some of the basic properties about our basic, uh, about our sister planet Venus, uh, such as uh, it's the size of its core. In addition to the interior measurements, we have also uh, measured the spin period on 21 occasions between 2006 and, two th and 2020. And what we've observed is that the spin period of Venus changes dramatically, changes by 20 minutes or so. And uh, the horizontal lines here show previous estimates of the average spin rate. Most of our points are actually not consistent with these average spin rates. And that's because there's a much larger variation that had been previously recognized. If we phase these measurements according to the diurnal phase, there's a tantalizing hit, hint that there's a, a diurnal periodicity here. And it turns out that uh, these variations are due to transfer of atmospheric angular momentum to the solid body. And it is possible that uh, these mountains at high, uh, high elevation topographic regions in the equatorial regions 
uh, interact sufficiently with the atmosphere that they launch, launch gravity waves that have been in fact detected in the upper atmosphere of Venus. And there's transfer of angular momentum due to these mountain torques. So uh, a very interesting uh, dynamic uh, situation at Venus where the length of the day changes. And again, uh, observations that have been enabled by the GBT. So I want to uh, discuss the future uh, for planetary radar. And there's a very exciting prospect of uh, possibly having a radar transmitter uh, at Green Bank. Been a, there's been a very successful test of a low power transmitter with uh, Raytheon at the GBT prime focus. You can see the box right here. Uh, they produced this beautiful image, uh, five meter resolution image uh, of the moon. And so we're all hoping that the next phase of this project, which is to get funding and install a higher power transmitter, uh, will be successful to enable uh, a lot of new exciting science. So I want to uh, end here um, um, with this uh, summary talk um, and express deep gratitude uh, for all the scientific staff and technical staff who enabled these uh, exciting radar observations at the GBT for more than 20 years. Thank you. All right, thanks, John Luke. Um, just I have a comment, and I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to ask a question. So, comment is that I sometimes joke about how pulsars are the only really high precision thing that we do at the GBT. But I got to say that, like being able to track the uh, the orbital period of Venus down to the one where you can see those diurnal variations is very cool. Um, I have a question about the the, the speckle stuff. So. Uh, is there something in particular about the GBT that kind of made that possible in collaboration with Goldstone? Is this a sensitivity thing? Do you need a particular baseline? The orientation of the baseline matters. Okay. And so having an east-west baseline is, is really helpful for these measurements. And the high, the high aperture as well, because what we end up doing, because the correlation epoch is so short, uh, and we want repeated measurements during that short interval, we're really looking at one second or two second integration. So we want a high signal to noise ratio to, to get high precision measurements. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else uh, that has questions? You can put them in the chat uh, or in the Q&A, or if you have permissions to do so, you can unmute yourself. I, I knew nothing about it. This is George Seilstead. I just I think I know the answer to this, but I might as well ask you. What about the quiet zone when radar has now been introduced into the quiet zone? And any problem with that? Is there still a quiet zone? Well, I think you're not doing radar observations when you're doing other observations. So I, I think you still have a quiet zone when the radar is off. Yeah, I, I had, I'm glad to hear that. I was. I had deduced that, but didn't know. So thank you. Hi, hey, Luke. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there are rumors of observa radar observations of Europa. You want to say anything about that? Yeah. So we've uh, we were successful in measuring uh, the same correlation with Europa and Ganymede. In fact, uh, these are exceeding. <laughs> exceedingly challenging measurements to do. They can only be done once every 12 years, essentially when uh, the Earth-Jupiter distance is close enough that there's enough signal to noise uh, to detect the correlation. It has been detected. We had planned on observing it in 2019 and 2020 to solidify our preliminary estimates. And unfortunately, the Goldstone Klystrons were out of commission for that entire time. So they wiped out two years of observations and the, uh, there are not going to be other opportunities until 2022, I believe, or 2023. Uh, but that's very high uh, on our priority list. At Europa, uh, we have a preliminary estimate of the obliquity, which has never been measured since the discovery of the satellite. And the obliquity suggests that um, Again, Europa is not entirely solid. It may provide evidence for uh, a subsurface ocean that decouples the outer layer uh, from the interior of the body. 
we would like to refine these estimates. We would also love to be able to measure a libration amplitude. And if that were detectable, it might give us additional information about the ice shell. Uh, if we could measure the moment of inertia of the ice shell, that would be phenomenal. That would give us an estimate of the ice shell thickness. So we're very much uh, looking forward to additional measurements um, as soon as possible. Ken's right. got his hand up, Ryan, um, yeah. and it's been up for a while. So I don't know if he wants to comment on this talk or the one before. Ken, are you still there? <laughs> yes, I am. It, it, was You're very patient. Be, it, was, it was actually going to be addressed to uh, uh, David. So well, we'll just, I'll just deal with that privately. Thanks. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments for John Luke or about this talk? Such a good talk, John Luke. Really fun. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, John Luke. Um, and Ken, if you do want to go ahead and ask a question, we're doing uh, pretty good on time here. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, David, I just wanted to ask you if there's any uh, plans to, uh, or any use or plans to use um, FAST to replace uh, Arecibo for nanograph. Um, yeah, so that's a very complicated question. I'm sure it is. So, so for sure, so FAST is, is doing a tremendous amount of, of pulsar science uh, even now. They've uh, made quite a few searches. You know, it's, it's more sensitive than Arecibo, so it ought, it ought to be doing that. Uh, they've started some pulsar timing programs. Uh, let's just say there's a lot of discussions and complicated politics in all of this. Maybe leave it at that. But, but it certainly, I think, should be playing a role in uh, high precision timing. I'll also say that, you know, I, I talked about our work with, you know, focus on GBT now and historically at Arecibo and bringing on CHIME and, and the VLA. But um, there's pretty good international collaboration for uh, pooling data and scientific ideas uh, across the Australian and European groups uh, and, uh, in, you know, with the goal of gravitational wave detection with pulsars. Um, the Indian group at GMRT has recently joined. Uh, and there certainly are discussions a lot with the Chinese uh, as well. So I think there's a, I don't know, astropolitics is always interesting, but it seems to be a pretty congenial community most of the time. I should add yeah. Meerkat too. Meerkat has been fantastic as well. So. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add that we are we have a collaboration with with FAST to do follow up of some of the FAST discoveries with the GBT. They've been doing this with Parks and other telescopes as well. So those collaborations are, are active. And, all right, so I think we're going to go ahead and probably switch gears a little bit. And uh, the next talk is on the business of making the GBT by Mike Holstein and Bill Porter. So Mike and Bill, are you guys there? Um, this is Jill. They recorded a video, okay. which I will be playing for them um, right now. So just All right, thanks, Jill. And I'll get that queued up. This is Bill. I am here if there are any questions. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this edition of the GBT at 20. Uh, we're going to talk about the business of making the GBT. I'm Mike Holstein. Uh, during the construction of the GBT, I was a facility engineer. I am a registered professional civil engineer, uh, but also um, was the business manager, uh, which is my current role for the Green Bank Observatory. And I have with me as, a, as part of this keynote, uh, my great friend and colleague, Bill Porter. Hey, Bill. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Bill Porter, as Mike said. I, too, am a, a registered professional civil engineer, now retired, unlike Mike. <laughs> uh, I worked at the observatory at NRAO from 1983 until 2008. Uh, and during those years, I enjoyed working on some very interesting telescope construction projects with, uh, I have to say, a host of amazing people throughout the NRAO and other observatories and organizations. Good projects, good people, good years, and I truly am grateful for them. Um, but we're here to talk about the Green Bank Telescope, uh, and as you know, it covered the decade of uh, the 1990s. 
Um, my, my role was business manager, working directly for the project manager, Bob Hall, uh, in the project office in Charlottesville. And we had a structurally, organizationally, we had a, a dotted line connection to the observatory uh, business office. The associate director, uh, Jim Desmond, uh, managed that work. And it was a solid organizational structure because this was a complex um, project, not only from the engineering and construction side, but also from the business side. And you had to be so, tough, right, Bill? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. Uh, yeah that that's what i look like in a lot of those meetings thanks yeah you're welcome <laughs> yeah <laughs> tough guy so uh, yeah tough guy if if you want to know more about the history of the early project development uh you should pick up a copy of uh the new book open skies uh, by kellerman bouton and brant uh, it's the story of nrao and it's a thorough history of of uh, all of NRAO, but uh, the chapter on the GBT is particularly uh, interesting and particularly applicable uh, to this story today. And you'll find that part of it just filled with astronomical drama and political intrigue, uh, which is part of the GBT. It's a real page turner. And uh, you'll learn more about the project's history than we'll be able to share with you today. But uh, to the Paul. project. Uh, Mike and I will talk about the business of making the GVT. Uh, my part, as the title said, um, as my title said, was to manage uh, the project business for the project manager and NRAO, which included uh, being a project interface with the observatory business office. Uh, at times uh, with AUI, occasionally with NSF. <laughs> But I think most importantly, um, with the site and the site business office, which of course was Mike. And I would echo what Mike said earlier. We started off this work as colleagues, but we have uh, we have developed a great friendship and the part, project was a large part of that, but it continues today. Um, we're also responsible, both of us, for developing and managing uh, the project budget uh, with the project team, writing and overseeing some of the contracts, uh, the procurements of the major suppliers and contractors, and generally serving uh, the project manager. Uh, one of the great pleasures of being in the project office was working with this team. Um, Bob Hall was the project manager. Lee King was the chief uh, structural engineer on the project. Chris Merrill worked uh, for Lee and did a lot of the computer uh, analysis of that complex structure. Greg Morris, the designer, and Mary Mayo, of course, was the glue that held us all together. She was the admin on the project. And one um, one that was not in the Charlottesville office, but we consider him part of us, was Sid Smith. We could not have built this project without Sid Smith. Uh, I would stand by that. So we were a tight group uh, and made the project successful in the end, I think. Yeah, you know, um, setting this stage up a little bit too, you know, everyone has to realize that no one, you know, not NRAO, not AUI, not even NSF, had ever built a telescope of this magnitude and scope, you know, a fully steerable 100 meter single dish telescope. It was new territory for everyone involved and it stretched our resources, there's no doubt about that. And it took design and construction to new levels, but, but you know, we did it. It's still, to this day, the largest fully steerable telescope on the planet, and it's still going strong. So doing something that big, that new, that difficult presents challenges that, that sometimes felt insurmountable, but, you know, strategic decisions in, in with the business team, with the project team, uh, dedication to the mission and the, and the right group of people, that, like you mentioned, with the work ethic needed, ensured that the job, you know, would get done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another thing, Mike, is as we talk about the project, um, I'd like for folks to be sure to understand the temporal context of what we're talking about, because it's easy to assume uh, things were like they are today, and they surely were not. Um, this event this week is the GBT at 20. The GBT was dedicated to service in August of 2000. So we're celebrating the 20th year of GBT scientific operations. But remember, the construction project covered a span of about 10 years. Um, and the work that 
Ike and I and the project staff were laboring to accomplish uh, during the construction phase actually began in the early 1990s. So we're really talking about 30 years ago. Um, the antenna, here's some data points for you. The antenna request for proposals was issued to bidders on June the 1st, 1990. Uh, NSF added the project appropriation to AUI's cooperative agreement on December 6th, 1990, where we were um, ready to move on the contract and they appropriated the money. And the antenna contract was signed on December the 19th, 1990. That's when the project really began um, in earnest for us. The point in that is that today is 2020 and 2021 technology was not available to the project in the early 1990s. And so when you look at that structure, it is complex and it was designed in the early 1990s, uh, completed and dedicated in 2000. And you know, the first iPhone wasn't even released until June, 2007. So that gives you a handle on how the technology um, may have been different than what we experienced today. So if you think critically about the project, remember that the technical context in which this marvelous instrument, this uh, amazing structure was designed and the tools and techniques that were available to the engineers and constructors at the time were very different. Yeah, it makes it to me even more special. Yeah. So, um, Rather than tell you about all of the interesting uh, business that Mike and I engaged in, in in terms of how contracts are bid and decisions are made and um, kind of you know signed and that sort of thing, we we thought we would tell you more about how we were engaged in the actual construction with a few anecdotes and stories that'll give you a glimpse into what the business of building a radio telescope is like. Um, for me personally, the largest most uh, interesting aspect, of course, was the antenna, uh, both the procurement and the construction. The successful firm in that was, uh, as you may know, Radiation Systems Incorporated under the leadership of Dick Thomas, Richard Thomas, up in Sterling, Virginia. They had done other work for NRAO and, and they took on the GVT. Um, and remember also that the entire GVT construction allocation from NSF was $75 million at the outset. Um, yeah. And 55 million of that was poured into the antenna contract. So that's just shy of 75% of the total project allocation, um, which meant that for most of the project, the antenna construction was the elephant in the room that everyone had to deal with. Um, progress on the antenna structure or lack of it affected nearly every other aspect of the construction, uh, which of course influenced the schedule and the budget. Yeah. So those those things give you the context of the project. There, there are a few stories and anecdotes that make the uh, construction memorable for me. There are too many to tell, but I'll mention a couple. Um, to provide a clear aperture, you know the Green Bank Telescope is a, a, a clear aperture dish. Um, it could not be a symmetrical parabolic shape. It, it is a paraboloid cut out of a much larger parabolic shape. The GBT, you can see from that drawing there, is a 100 meter section out of a 208 meter diameter parabolic dish. It's this asymmetry uh, that, of course, allows the uh, focal point to be off the face of the dish which makes the backup structure and, and the structural design of the telescope very difficult. Um, it's because it's not symmetrical. And that means every member is its own design. Um, I remember a design review meeting where the design, the contract designers were struggling about how to perfect a, a portion of the, of the dish. And the contractor would present their concept, um, our head engineer, Lee King, who truly is a great structural engineer and a gentleman, would listen patiently and then explain to them why their design would not work. <laughs> so they, they would offer another concept and Lee would listen and explain why it would not work. And after a few rounds of trying to figure out this problem, the lead contract engineer uh, basically pleaded Lee, you know how to solve this. We don't. Would you please just help us and tell us? And uh, they got it figured out. They worked together. Um, and 
I think that is actually an important point on the, on the project and the observatory. That, and there were similar cases uh, with other contractors and other aspects of the project. Radio telescopes are pretty unique instruments. And our engineers and technicians often um, know more than the contractors we hire to build them. And it takes teamwork across organizations. Uh, and I think the fact that the GBT is, has been so successful is a demonstration of how we how well we worked with the contractors all across the board to make that telescope. Yeah, I, I agree um, with that entirely. It's so true. Um, the other aspect, one other aspect is we had incredible iron workers on the project. This, yeah. you know, the size of this structure and every one of those members was uh, hung in the air and welded, uh, positioned and welded by, by some great iron workers. It's, it's made up of large, uh, heavy welded beams. Some of those um, beams were are two or three inch thick iron uh, and had to be welded up into those shapes and then hung in the air. And when you get them up in the air, of course, uh, they're monstrous to move around and they come together in these nodes or knuckles. Um, sometimes you'll have six or eight of these coming together at one point. And I remember in one case, um, the last beam to be hoisted up into one of these complex assemblies um, connected and met at one end, but not at the other. It was out of alignment. Um, and so they had to figure out a way how to bring it the other end into alignment uh, where it had to be welded. And that wasn't an easy job, but I do remember this, uh, these guys were experienced, knew what to do. And they solved it by uh, grinding out a series of dados uh, on the back of the beam that needed to be brought into line. And then they would go around and, uh, with torches and just pour heat onto the front side of this huge beam. And as the front of the beam heated up, of course it grew and, um, and the dados on the backside allowed it to bend back where it needed to go. And it just curled right into place and they welded it into place in the knuckle and then uh, went to the backside and welded up the dados, made them solid, ground them smooth and painted them. And there it was. And I thought, man, that is a remarkable skill. Yeah. They were, they were good. Yeah, the, the size of those, uh, the thickness of those, you, you know, even in the summer, when they were going to weld them, even when they fit, they had to heat up that steel. It was just amazing so that they could get a full weld throughout the entire uh, structure, throughout the thickness of it. Amazing structure. Well, and of course, there are other uh, truly interesting contracts uh, as part of the GBT that, um, there are two that I would mention here that I remember well. One is the subreflector. The subreflector was made by a firm called Milliflect out in uh, California. Joe Ruschow was the head of that. And of course, you realize, if you think about it, if you have an asymmetric primary reflector, you also have to have an asymmetric subreflector um, to, match, to match the main reflector. And Milliflect uh, had to custom mold uh, require, the required surface uh, on this asymmetric subreflector and measure it to a very tight specification. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, this was in the 1990s and uh, there, there weren't a whole lot of uh, machines that would do something like that. And so the surface of the subreflector had to be laid up by hand uh, and sanded and shaped. Uh, and then every time they, they made a mark on it or, or put on a new uh, layer, they had to shape it, sand it, and measure it. And that was quite an effort. And then, of course, at the end, when they had the shape perfect, it was uh, they put a flame spray surface on it. It was, it was a real technical exercise to watch. And, and these people were artists as much as they were just engineers and, and builders. Uh, the other one I would mention is the, uh, you know, the antenna active surface uh, is... Uh, is driven by uh, motored actuators uh, behind every panel corner intersection. Uh, the actuators were manufactured and built uh, into the motor assemblies by uh, Industrial Devices Corporation out in uh, Novato, California, uh, headed up by Jim Griffin. The, the actuators um, had to be tested 
and, and of course, I go through a quality assurance program. They had to pass rigorous performance tests. The motors did as well. They came in as a separate component. And then these two things were married up and the final um, motor and actuators assembly had to test out well. There, there was, uh, it was a serious industrial engineering um, uh, effort for the guys. And they had to track every one of those components in every assembly for over uh, 2,200 units. So that was a great effort as well. And I, I remember them fondly. Yeah, you know, there so. we had a lot of the, you know, a lot of these pieces that you're talking about were contracts, subcontracts, whatever they might be. But then there was, while the antenna was being fabricated in Texas, there was a lot of infrastructure work underway in Green Bank. And, you know, there was activity everywhere. I mean, basically everywhere you look, this was the big, big project. And, and there were things happening beyond the structure, uh, but things that were being done because of the structure. Um, you know, the GBT is huge. It's, it's a big, big structure. And one of the problems that they had was how to actually fit these pieces uh, within a, uh, you know, the, the reach of a standard crane and, and they actually couldn't. So one of the things that, uh, that they had to, to get was what was called a Derrick crane. And you can see it on the right side of the picture here. Um, a, the Derrick crane was so large, it had to, it had to have a boom reach of like 250 feet or better. Um, there were only two of them in the United States, and we got one in Green Bank, but it took the contractor six months to build that dairy crane in order to start working on the antenna structure, and, and it was unique. You know, you, as you said, think back to the 90s, the operator of that crane actually sat on the ground down, down at the base of it. And the huge spool of winch cable was there in front of him and there was one beside of him. And he had this cabin and there were video cameras up on the, on the, on the crane boom and different parts of the structure that fed a video feed by cable back down to him in his cabin. So he watched the pick points and he did all of this stuff, you know, sitting downstairs in this cabin um, control room. It was really cool. And then, of course, we had other large um, cranes on the site, too, that had to help uh, maneuver pieces over to where the dairy crane could reach it and, and things like that. But, you know, a lot of things happened on the site and, and for the construction uh, that we didn't have money for in order to contract it out. So NRAO had to do these things themselves. And you know, fortunately, we had the talent to do them in-house. Um, you know, we designed and installed the electrical feed to the GBT. That, that was in-house. We built four uh, large prototype laser ranging monuments for the um, active surface. And we built, uh, well, there are 12 of them around the GBT, but we couldn't build those on the site until we prototyped them out and had the the room to do it uh, away from the contractor. So we built four of them at the Hubbard foot to test these things out. Um, the plant maintenance crew in Green Bank did a good bit of the work and we converted the old 300 foot control building to a laser metrology lab and built a laser ranging system in there. And one of the piers had to be 90 degrees from the, the main range. And those guys, you know, drilled through the floor and, and, and built this pier up and the monument inside that basement. And they did it within uh, 20 thousandths of an inch. I mean, it was pretty incredible the amount of work that they did. Um, we built a new road around the GBT site because of the metrology system. Um, we actually estimated that about 2,200 tractor trailers would be delivering steel on that old road uh, and up through Green Bank, which kind of brings me to an interesting story about Steve Bridge. I'm sure you remember Steve. Uh, he was the construction supervisor. 
for R RSI. Yeah. Um, on site one day meeting with Steve and Bob, uh, one of the large tractor trailers came in and, you know, they had these flag cars, these escort cars that led these oversized loads up Route 92. And driving the car was this woman who pulled the car up all the way up to where we were standing while the truck went around to the offload point. And she stuck her head out the window and she said, what in the world are y'all building all the way out here in Green Bay? And Steve, you know, without missing a beat, he just kind of tilted his head down, you know, in the window. And he said, we don't know. All the pieces aren't here yet. <laughs> it was great. You know, and a lot of the pieces were put together in Mejia, uh, Mejia Texas, right? I think is how you pronounce it. Yes, sir. You can ask for Mexico, but you won't get there. Yeah. <laughs> it's Mejia. Mahia. Uh, so then they were disassembled and shipped to Green Bank. But you can actually see some evidence of that. You know, it's an all welded structure. But in order to do that, they bolted the pieces together, Mahia, because they didn't want to cut them apart. And one of the business decisions was to leave the bolt ears in place. And so you can still see those angled brackets on some of the steel down there because it cut what it costs money to cut them off, right? Yes, it did. Um, the sort of as evidence of how that was done, the dish backup structure uh, was actually put together on the ground there in Green Bank. Um, and to fit it, to make sure that it was going to fit right. And uh, then it was disassembled off of this huge concrete pad down there and lifted up into place by that huge dairy crane in 22 separate modules. Uh, and they were putting their final resting place on the elevation structure and then uh, surveyed into place. And so, you know, the, the bold ears on the telescope, the huge concrete pad, you know, once the construction was done, uh, was to be removed. And even the warehouse that was down there was to be removed by the contractor. So part of the decisions for either cost savings or for the good of, of the site and long term of the project was to decide whether to take those things out or whether to leave them in place. And if you go down there, you'll see the warehouse is still there. The concrete pad is still there and those bolt ears are, are still in place. Um, and one example of having the, you know, you never, think you have the staff you need to do all the things you want to do, but there was so much talent at NRAO and in Green Bank. And one of the things that needed done was that to make this active surface work, we had to install these retro reflectors and they had to be uh, glued to the surface and, and screwed down partially. And, and they had to work just right so that you, we could use this new laser ranging system and Todd Wright, who's now our plant maintenance supervisor, was a part-time janitor at the time of construction. And needing to get these installed, Todd volunteered to be trained. And he personally installed almost every retro reflector on the dish. And there you can see a, 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 a sample of how many of those things there are and how well that worked on the, on the structure. Amazing. You know, Mike, uh, we've mentioned some of the people we work with on this project, and, but there's so many we haven't mentioned. And um, I, I just have these great memories of a wonderful staff um, all through the observatory uh, in Charlottesville and Green Bank that helped us out. And I think teamwork was just a crucial part of the whole thing. Uh, absolutely. Couldn't agree more with that. And um, I don't know, I, as far as you and I go and the things we've done together, one of my favorite memories uh, involves the, near the end of the project where, um, of course, in NRAO's business system, uh, we capitalized our projects uh, so the federal government could account for them. 
And um, it, it was called a capital equipment uh, inventory or a capital equipment listing. And yep. each of the observatory items of capital equipment uh, has a unique inventory number. And I think in those days we said that uh, the dollar amount of a piece of capital equipment at $5,000. That's right. Um, the, the GBT was a little more than that. But every piece of capital equipment got a blue tag number, uh, which was the identifying number associated with it, so that its location could be tracked and verified during the annual equipment inventories. And I remember when Mike and I attached blue tag to the GBT structure uh, so the fiscal office could capitalize the machine and track it. Um, I, I just felt good. It, it's, it was a milestone that we were looking for. There we are doing that. And I, I've always slept a little better knowing that the GBT could never be misplaced now. Um, or if it is, if someone finds it and reports it uh, to the observatory, the, the blue tag number on it will allow the business office to identify it, recover it, and bring it home. Yeah. <laughs> Always been glad about that. But uh, seriously, finally, they, they uh, we agree, Mike and I, I know, and others as well, that the GBT was a great project, and it yielded a great scientific instrument. Uh, I remember the exceptional team of NRAO engineers, scientists, administrators, and other staff, and, and I was proud to be a part of it. And, of course, the project office was in Charlottesville, and the construction site was in Greenbank. Uh, and so there was plenty of opportunity, I think, for an us and them uh, ethos to sort of develop, but it never did, and I never perceived it. And I think that is in a large part due to the Green Bank staff. And so I, I remember well when we were visiting the site, which was often, uh, how hospitable and welcoming and kind, uh, how accommodating and supportive the Green Bank staff was to us. And I just want to say thanks to you, Mike, and to all of the folks there. Um, I love your town. I love your site. Uh, and the people over there, and I love that big beast of a machine that sits out there in that field. So to anyone who listened to this, who was involved in the GBT, had a hand in it, thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. I, very kind words, but I absolutely agree. Um, I think that um, thanks do go to anyone who had a hand in this project. And so uh, for that, uh, I really appreciate you coming in and um, I hope to see you soon. If you'll get that site open, I'll be over there. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Bill and Mike. I know you guys are both on. Any other thoughts you want to share live? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's there are thousands of stories. Uh, one that Rich, uh, you got time for two minutes. I'll tell you my my most interesting memory. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Um, Rich Lacasse was talking this morning about the uh, the actuators and the actuator motors and assemblies and everything that went on out there at IDC, uh, Industrial Devices Corporation. I remember when um, we went out to do the final negotiation for that deal. Um, we were meeting with Jim Griffin, who was the owner uh, of the company, and it was, a, it was a fairly small operation by industrial standards. We were going to be his biggest customer if he got this award. And um, <clears throat> I remember uh, it was Bob Hall, myself, and Frank Cerna. Some people will remember Frank. He was a consultant to us. He was an industrial uh, engineer, um, a, uh, a manufacturing engineer, and a quality assurance expert. And I remember the, uh, the four of us were sitting in uh, Jim's office talking through the project and, and we're uh, getting ready to, to execute the contract and award it to him. And Frank leaned over and whispered something to Bob and Bob kind of got one of those looks on his face like, oh crap. And, um, and then he turned around and asked Jim if, if we could just have a few minutes alone to talk. And, um, and so Jim Griffin, the, the owner of the company, left, uh, and we were sitting there. And Bob said, "So what is this?" And Frank, who uh, he, he was a brilliant man uh, and a and a great engineer, um, went through 
the project as it had been laid out before us uh, to, to build these things and so forth. And Frank had done basically this back of an envelope sort of uh, time motion study and what it was going to take to build these things. And as Rich mentioned, there's 2,400 of them. I said 2,200 in my talk. Rich is right. There were 2,400. And I think the difference was in the spares that we bought. But um, Frank basically said, you can't you can't award this to him at the price he has offered you. You will drive him out of business. Um, and we talked through it with Frank, and actually we realized he was right, um, that Jim had bid low to get the work, but he had bid so low that when you really looked at what we were going to require them to do, uh, he, he just couldn't do it. And so we're sitting there, and Bob, I remember today, Bob turned to me and he said, Bill, you're going to have to negotiate his price up. And I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, you know, everything we do is about getting prices down. And now you're telling me I've got to negotiate some guy's price up that, you know, that just didn't, didn't sit well, but, but we talked about it and, and uh, actually with Frank's help, we did it very carefully and gently by walking Jim through his own production processes and saying, now, how are you going to do this? And he would explain it and we'll say, how many men you got and what are you paying them? And, and, you know, all of a sudden you could see the light going on in his head um, that he really needed more money to do this. And we were gracious and, and allowed him to raise the price. The important thing to remember is because we were buying 2,400 of them, if you add a dollar to the price of one actuator, you're actually adding $2,400 to the, to the contract. And so we, we were careful and it worked out okay. But it goes back to my notion that, you know, sometimes in order to save the project, you got to help save your contractors too. Um, and I think we were good at that. I, I'm proud of us. That's all. That's my most interesting memory. It's the only time in my life I've ever been told uh, you got to negotiate somebody's price up for the observatory. I'm going to guess that's probably one of the few times he's the uh, contractor heard something like that too. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, thanks. Any other uh, questions before we close up this session? This has been great. I really enjoyed this. Can, can, can I can I just make a, a comment that, yeah, uh, that, they, that 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 these guys? Uh, I agree that these guys uh, are masterful uh, business managers. I, I would like to say that that Bill uh, is not always quite as generous as uh, as that story might uh, might indicate. Uh, I, I I recall. Um, Sitting in a, in one negotiation uh, that that Bill had, and uh, after some long harangue, uh, uh, Bill had uh, uh, one of his responses. He said, "You know, I love you like a brother." And then the 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 next thing was uh, he dropped the hammer, and uh, <laughs> that uh, there there were there were several like that. So uh, I don't think he lost many negotiations, Bill. Well. It was great. I just love this work. Rich, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that I'd never heard that story about negotiating the price up. And I worked on that project for 10 years of my life. It, it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, the other thing is that you said there were two parts that the, they had to integrate together, the motors and the actuator. There was actually a third part, the LVDT, the position sensor. Yeah. So all of those things got shipped to IDC and they put them together and tested them and sent them to us. And when we sent them back the first 1200, they had to, they had to send the motors back to San Diego to get worked on because, uh, because of that Loctite thing I was talking about. So they, they were a very helpful, good contractor. They were very impressive. Part yeah, of, part, of the, part of the price increase that Frank pointed out to us was that he was a, a QA, QC engineer. He knew what they were going to have to do. And he also was, he, he was aware that there would be some of this back and forth. And because each of those component pieces had its own serial number and they were married into assemblies, all of that stuff had to be tracked. And when they took, sent one back and they had to take it apart, put it back together with a different part. All of that stuff had to be tracked. And it was a real accounting project. And they weren't set up to do it when they started. But they got set up. So that's good.
So I see Jay, you were raising your hand and then Paul and then Suzanne. Oh uh, yeah. Um, for much of the project, uh, I was kind of an outsider asked to give occasional science advice, uh, but would sit in with some of the project meetings. And I don't hear the, the um, participation by the JPL engineers mentioned much, but it seemed to me we got an enormous amount of help from uh, maybe a half a dozen of them in the JPL antenna division. Yeah, I think Verl Lobb was uh, the primary JPL. He, he was a consultant to us. Um, and um, I don't, let's see. I don't remember the names of the others. I, there were certainly a number of JPL engineers involved in the BLBA design as well. And so they've, they've always been a good partner as far as I know. Hmm. All right, uh, Paul? Yeah, uh, Bill, how many change orders did we request? Of... Who? During the construction, we did we have any change orders with RSI in the contract? Yeah, uh, there were. How many? Um, if you all want to talk amongst yourselves, I can go drag out my copy of the contract. And no, 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 just guess. I mean, a lot or just a couple? Oh, I would say just a few, just a few. Mike and I have always had competitions over who could complete a project with the fewest number of change orders. Yeah. I remember the day when I went over and told him how proud I was the fact that we'd only had a few change orders on the GBT and he shot me down because he had just built the uh, this science dorm room bunkhouse out in the front of the uh, residence hall and he said I built that without a single change order. <laughs> and I said well how Mike you built a shoebox you know we're building something a little bigger here. <laughs> uh, anyway uh, no there weren't many um, and I'd have to go look though to give you a real number. No problem. Right, I just raised my hand, Ryan, to tell yes. you that Jay needed his hand raised. So oh, okay. I don't need to have my hand raised. So uh, Rich, you can go. Yeah, go Rich. Rich, you're muted. Rich, we can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted, Rich. I was just going to mention that Ben Parvin uh, at JPL was a big help on the servo system. Bill probably remembers him now. Uh, he had a lot more experience than Tim Whedon than I did, and it was, it was great to have him on the project. There's an attendee with their hand raised that I, I allowed to talk. Stephen, do you want to close out our comments for this session? There you are. Can you speak? You're, oh, you're, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> He's still muted. Maybe you want to put it in the chat. You'll have to unmute yourself. So while Stephen is doing that, uh, Jill, do you want to give us some uh, end of session announcements about restarting the web in R? Sure, yeah, um, a lot going on on my computer. We are going to um, hit pause on this webinar so we can save the recording. So you'll see the meeting end, but you can get back in for the next section starts at 430 just by using any of the emails or links that we sent you when you registered. So don't be alarmed when you see this session end. Um, if you're a panelist or if you're an attendee, just go ahead the registration emails we sent you and you'll be able to get right in. Sound good? Deal. All right. We don't want to lose this, this nectar that we've been collecting today. <laughs> you're all, your back and forth was just the best. You guys did a great job on your talk. It's easy oh, with Mike. <laughs> All right, everybody, we reconvene at 4.30, am I right? 4.30. And we are going to start with Sophie, who's going to do a trivia. That's what's going to happen first at 4.30. All right. <laughs> I hope you paid attention to this round because that's what the trivia next time is on. All right. Sounds good.
Bless your skills. See you in a little bit. Thank you, everyone.